What's up, everybody? I am your host, a sharp stick with a doll's head named Staphne, and that is my co-host, a titty-sucking parasite. And welcome to the Grindhouse Syndicate, where on this episode, we talk about how we got hit by a fucking hurricane. <laughs> and it screwed up our lives and our schedule. Uh, yeah, so... The the day started, uh, the city was closed down, everything was closed, we were all off work, and I decided on this nice stormy day to watch The Evil Dead Rise, because we'd just done the original Evil Dead, and I was just in an Evil Dead mood. Well, that ended up being kind of the last normal day we had for that week, so we just decided to cover The Evil Dead Rise. Plus, it was uh, both of our favorite movie of last year. You pi- you You yeah. originally picked it, right? Yeah. I figured what what better time to cover Evil Dead Rise than right after covering Evil Dead. Because there's a lot of stuff in this movie that I didn't realize. Kind of is there's a lot of odes and Easter eggs in this to the original Evil Dead. And just I you know, we already wanted to cover it. It was both of our top rated movies, so what better time to cover it? Yeah, it was unfortunate that We were covering it when so much stuff was going on and we had to kind of throw everything together and the episode comes out late, but hey, it's over. We're safe. All our shit is okay. And we are officially back at it. And I'm excited to talk about this movie because I fucking love this movie. I, I went back and looked to see what I had rated it when we did the best of, was it like, didn't we do that in like January, I think? And it's like December or January. It's the we last did. episode of the year. Yeah, but yeah. So I went back and I was like, "Yeah, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still okay with with the, around that rating." Like I rated a four point five last year. What did I rate it? Because I couldn't remember. I thought it was initially a four point five, but then I thought it might have been a little higher because I thought that I gave. No, actually, don't. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. Check. Oh, I just, just fuck me, right? I'm well, just a titty sucking fucking parasite every all three of them. I actually just fuck my ratings. I didn't listen to the episode. <laughs> I just looked in my book to see what I wrote down about it. I couldn't remember where my book was at. Oh. Um and and I have it all in my notes. It washed away in the flood. I have them in my old phone for my notes in my old phone. And uh it's dead as fuck, so that's yeah. that's oh. my excuse. Uh, yeah, but crazy week, but, um, let's fucking talk about the Evil Dead Rise. Yeah, let's do it. But first, if you want to stay up to date on what is going on with us or the show, talk about or submit your movie request, or just say hey, you can always find us at one of our social media accounts or our official website at grindhousehorrorpod.com, Facebook at the Grindhouse Syndicate Horror Podcast, Instagram at grindhousesyndicate.org.pod, and many more, which you can find links for in the show notes as always. And please subscribe or follow for alerts on new episodes. And if you really love us and don't want us to attempt to translate the Book of the Dead, which brings on a hurricane that floods our city, give us a review. Evil Dead Rise is a 2023 American supernatural horror film written and directed by Lee Cronin. It is a standalone entry and the fifth installment in the Evil Dead film series. The film stars Lily Sullivan and Alyssa Sutherland as two estranged sisters trying to survive and save their family from deadites. So originally there were some plans for direct sequels to the Evil Dead uh, remake from 2013 the Army of Darkness from 1992, and the fourth season of Ash vs. Evil Dead. But, for some reason, by October of 2019, all of those ideas were scrapped and Sam Raimi announced that a new film was in development. With Rob Tapert producing and Raimi and Bruce Campbell executive producing. So the boys are back together. We got the OG team from the original Evil Dead. We need that. The the boys are back in town. We need that on we, the soundboard for that. We can't. We would <laughs> get copyright okay. struck pretty quickly. Yeah. Well, we'll have to. We'll have to change it slightly. The, hum, hum it in your head. The men are back in town. Sure. <laughs> you gotta cut that shit. The fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, I did. I did watch the director talk about coming up with this idea, 
and him taking it to Sam Raimi. Because actually, a, I don't know if you have this, you can cut this if you do, but it is the, in the Army of Darkness, there's three books, and we've already had two, and he wanted to do a movie on the third, and it would give him kind of a fresh start and, and make more sense of it being in the city. And he said Sam Raimi was, was definitely on board. He was stoked about it. So. Yeah, it was a great idea. So in June 2020, Campbell revealed that Lee Cronin was handpicked by Raimi to write and direct the film, then titled Evil Dead Now. After Cronin previously co- collaborated with Raimi on the horror streaming series 50 States of Fright. In May of 2021, New Line Cinema, who, uh, if you remember from our previous episode, actually picked up the film just based off of Stephen King's uh, rating, like, review of the movie. Uh, but they picked this one up, and it was scheduled to be released on HBO Max and retitled Evil Dead Rise. How much money do you think Evil Dead's made New Line Cinema? Just off the two that we've just covered. That's well, a good you, bit of money. You remember, no one really knows how much the original Evil Dead. It was like two million to twenty nine million. No one had any fucking idea. This it was one, two. Though, it was two point nine million. It's somewhere between two point nine million and twenty nine million. Yeah, I'm like that's that's a thousand percent increase from two point nine million. Like yeah. somewhere in there, somewhere in those giant numbers. Uh, but this one, they made some. They made some uh, change off this. Budget somewhere between a dollar and $29 billion. Somewhere in there. I'm confident. Yeah. I think the budget for this is $15 million. Yeah, I think they said it was 15 or 16 Yeah. Uh, it, it made a ton of money. It did. So principal photography took place in New Zealand from June to October of 2021. The film was originally set to premiere on the streaming service HBO Max but distributor Warner Brothers Pictures opted to release the film theatrically first after very positive test screenings. Evil Dead Rise had its world premiere at South by Southwest on March 15th of 2023 and was theatrically released in the United States on April 21st of 2023 by Warner Brothers Pictures. The film received positive reviews from critics and grossed over a hundred and forty seven million dollars worldwide, becoming the highest grossing film of the series. Take that people who say this movie sucks and Blumhouse because it seems like only only Blumhouse is like making hundred and fifty two hundred million dollar horror movies. Most of them are ghost movies. I bet this you. Is- they would fucking kill a child to get their hands on Evil Dead IP. They they may have already killed some children. <laughs> Those fucking titty sucking parasites, man. You got to get rid of them. So director Lee Cronin stated the film used over 1,717 gallons of fake blood. The fake blood is a mixture of food-based dyes, high fruit. Oh fuck! I'm not gonna be able to say this. High fructose. Fructose, fructose, fructose. Fructose. I can never say this word. Corn syrup and water, a recipe used by special effects supervisor Brendan Dury. Due to the amount of fake blood needed, a commercial food manufacturer was hired to produce the substance, and large bulk shipping containers were used to transport and store it. As with past installments in the series, the film relied more heavily on practical effects than computer generated imagery. The bathroom in Beth's apartment was built on hydraulics to allow the set to shake. The apartment elevator was built in a steel frame that allowed it to be lifted or dropped. It was outfitted with removable wooden paneling that was treated to avoid being stained by fake blood. In April of 2023, Bruce Campbell stated that he, Sam, and Ivan Ramey were planning for possible future films in the franchise every two or three years if Evil Dead Rise is a success. Well, I think that it was a success. Yes, it's definitely a success. Uh, $150 million, that's pretty good. In February of 2024, it was reported that Sebastian Vanekek, Vanekek? was attached to direct and co-write a new spin-off film of the Evil Dead franchise, while in April of 2024, it was announced that another Evil Dead film was in development with Ghost House Pictures producing 
Francis Galeppi will serve as writer and director as being handpicked by Raimi. So yeah, we talked about on the last episode that we had we had heard there was two Evil Dead movies coming down the pipeline. And here we go. This is going to be uh, both of them. I don't know if they're going to come out at the same time or... I don't know how that's going to go, but either way, we got two more to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm excited and scared. Just I'm scared they start trying to push them out too fast for the for the massive amounts of money that they pull in that things will get shaky. But, you know, like I said when when they announced Evil Dead Rise and it was going to be in the city, I was like, "Oh god, no. This is going to be fucking awful." And I was wrong. So, it's going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Man, if they just, I, I think one of the benefits is they have like the original people, yeah, you know, executive producing these movies and they know the formula. Give us fucking, give us a book, give us demons taking people over, lots of blood and that, that's it. That's all we need. Like that's the Evil Dead formula and it works, works every time. So ratings, Rotten Tomatoes gave it this a 84%. Pretty high for Rotten Tomatoes, I would yeah, say. I was surprised. IMDb gave it a 6.6 .6 out of 10. Letterboxd, a disappointing 3.2 out of 5. And I don't know what the fuck is wrong with the Google average audience, but they gave it a 3 out of 5. I've seen that, man. It's a bunch of fucking haters. I bet you a bunch yeah. of people who hate this movie are going to rate it like a zero because they didn't fucking like it. Because it's like, you know, a lot of people love this movie, and then there always had to be those against the grain, like, oh, I fucking hate it, it didn't do this, and it didn't do that, and I, I really, honestly, I've, I've not heard a, a really val valid argument on why this movie's so awful from the people who actually hate it. Everybody has their own opinions, but I feel like that rating is definitely being hurt by that. Well, if you, I don't know if we, t I can't remember if we talked about it the last episode, but you remember all the people that fucking hated the 2013 remake, trashed it. Yeah. And then this came out and all of a sudden, all those same people were like, well, the, the remake was great, but Evil Dead Rise sucked. Now all of a sudden the remake is like this, you know, amazing film, which it's, yes. it's fantastic. But a lot of people changed their opinions on the remake. Once this came out, it's like they kind of want to hate the newest thing yeah. because it's new. Well, we've seen that plenty of times in, in cinema. That's the, the Phantom Menace effect. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is very true. Uh, if you would like to watch this movie, you can currently find it streaming on HBO Max. All right. So are you ready to jump into the plot of this phenomenal movie? I am. All right. So we start off just like the original where we get this POV shot of the evil entity just zooming through the woods. I'm very glad that they put this in there, especially because we had just watched the original. So kind of spotting these little things that were big in the in the first movie. I just I'm a loser who thinks that that shit's cool. Yeah, I, I actually put here love that this starts going through the woods. Yeah. And. It's funny because at the end of the last episode, we were talking about how that they would do this with drones now very easily. Yeah. And I completely forgot. Maybe it was just deep in my mind is why it came out. But I forgot that this movie starts out with a drone going through the woods. So we pop out of the woods onto a nice, calm and peaceful lake where we see a young woman relaxing while reading a book. Our POV shot flies right up to her where it is revealed to be a drone that is being operated by her friend's douchey rich frat boy boyfriend. You can tell that these two really don't like each other at all, but the girl asks the rich frat boy about her friend Jessica and he responds that he does not know what is wrong with her but he gave her some medication to help her sleep it off. We then jump to a cabin in the woods. I will say I wish they would have went with a more classic cabin. Yeah, the, like the they had the big a like giant A frame. Like, yeah, this would be a cabin that would be like somewhere I would think in like Alaska or something that the snow would fall off of easy. Yeah, it's it's um, very like Colorado ski yeah, cabin somewhere where there's a lot of snow. Interesting thing is that cabin is just you know it was built just for this movie has no inside. It just has the outside. Just a just a set built yeah. by some water. Yeah, the inside doesn't really match the outside. 
Uh, yeah. The inside kind of looks like the inside of the original. OG with, cabin. With, with a curtain hung up. Yeah, I'm surprised that they switched it up to like this completely different cabin, but it's a, it's a minor it's a minor issue I have with it. So one really cool thing, I know I've already mentioned this to you, but when they get to the inside of the cabin, the first shot is a clock. And it is the exact same clock from the original Evil Dead. Yeah, you told me and I missed it again. You mi- they I keep missing it. They put it in your face. I, I know. don't know how you mi- like they literally show it like twice and it's very it's, obvious. My brain is not registering it for some reason. It, it, I watched it two times this week. <laughs> yeah, it's the, literally the first scene in the cabin and then and then they show the girl laying on the bed and then they go back to it again. It's like it's like they're rubbing it in your face. Yeah, I don't know. So we see the girl who was reading a book by the lake she then goes to check on her friend Jessica, who is passed out on the bed. She tries talking to her, get, but gets very minimal responses. So she decides to sit in the chair in the corner of the room and continue reading her book. And as she begins, she notices that all of a sudden, Jessica is sitting straight up with her back towards her in the bed. Jessica then begins speaking, but at first it doesn't really make any sense until... Her friend realizes that Jessica is reading out loud the pages from her book, which is of course impossible considering she is on the other side of the room with her back turned. Now, this is very obviously a reference to the original movie where Cheryl stares out of the window while the other two girls play cards and Cheryl starts calling out the cards before revealing she's been possessed. Yeah. Great addition. Yeah, I, I this this is watching this right after watching the first. I noticed so many things like this, like little small things that were like odes and Easter eggs to the original, and it is is become one of my favorite parts of this movie. Yeah, it's it's it just sprinkles things in. There are people that are big fans of kind of the the origin of the series. So she is reading this book and this, of course, is freaking the other girl out. We then start hearing Jessica's voice turn deeper and demonic. The girl then screams at Jessica to stop where the room goes silent and Jessica just collapses off the side of the bed. She then slowly walks over to check on her friend where we see Jessica is now very pale with dark circles under her eyes and blue lips, just like Cheryl was. Because yeah, you remember when Cheryl first turns, like she doesn't have that crazy fucking looks like she's dead makeup. She just has a very pale circles, blue lips. Like it's it's very on point. Yeah, yeah. It's, she's it's definitely a it's a very quick process, and we don't ever see it actually change. But yeah, when they when they first turn, they look like they just died essentially. So she looks dead at first, but of course we know that this is not the case. She suddenly opens her eyes and begins coughing up the white liquid that we have seen in previous films, which the original white liquid was like the 2% milk, if I remember right. This stuff seems a little more translucent looking. It looks kind of like semen. Looks looks a little (laughs) bit like somebody spent some time on the casting couch. (laughs) So once this happens, the girl runs over to help Jessica. She's kind of like convulsing, and then she fake dies because. This is probably the Deadites' like main trick is the fake death. Playing possum. They do it. There's over... a whole page in the, in every Necronomicon about playing possum. <laughs> I, it's literally they do it over and over in like every movie. But her friend is like, "Oh no, Jessica's dead." You know what? What the fuck am I gonna do? And Deadite Jessica then grabs the girl's throat with one hand and grabs her hair with the other, and then proceeds to rip her fucking scalp off. I like good it. Shit. Yeah. Good shit. And I'm the, always the, here the, for the, scalp ripping. The scalp drop too when she's walking out on the deck. Like yeah. it's 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 very scalp like. Uh, <laughs> sure, make you hairdressers out there cringe. Ugh. Uh, we then jump back to the dock where we see Rich Frat Boy pissing into the water while his drone hovers close by, and as he turns around, we see the now bloody bald girl asking for his help. Deadite Jessica then walks up behind him, dropping her friend's bloody scalp on the dock. She then grabs the drone and puts it to her face, right into the blades, and it causes her to fall into the water. Fratboy freaks out and dives in to save her, where of course he gets pulled under and we just see the water turn blood red. 
Bro, I would not, nope. not have jumped in after her, considering the circumstances. Well, looking for one like, of those circle things that people throw in the water with like a life. It's not a life. It's yeah. uh, the, the donut. The donut they have <laughs> on the boat. Just like, where's that? I'll just throw that in I, there. I would. After seeing that, I would have been like, I, hopefully she don't come up. <laughs> he's like, that colada pin fucked her up. <laughs> yeah, he's probably trying to save her. Like, I'm going to go to prison. Yeah. Like, they're going to find out I gave her one of my colada pins and she's. She then fucking ripped her face off with the drone and drowned. So we are now just left with bloody bald girl who is crying on the dock when suddenly frat boy's decapitated head flies out from under the water and lands next to her. And then we see an awesome looking deadite Jessica with demon eyes rise out of the water like Jesus and the blood red title card evil dead rise literally rises behind her this is a fucking great cold open to a movie and exactly what happened to jesus this is just what happened to sure him. floated right out of the water <laughs> um i i i, 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 love, I love everything about st- this intro stole my thunder <laughs> the, well no the, i'm gonna say the only thing i dis- disliked about this intro the only nitpick i have was the cgi on the face of the guy who gets his head the fucking frat boy douchebag who gets his head and shoulders ripped off when he lands other than that everything and and when you watch the rest of this movie and you see all what they put into practical effects i can forgive him on that yeah we went we went to the theater as soon as this came out i think it was like the first night it was out and i remember we're in our seats and you were really skeptical about how it was going to go i was optimistic and then when I seen her come out of the water and we get this huge evil dead rise in the music and I was like, I just like, I just breathed a sigh of relief because I was like, oh God, he's not going to be right. I think, I think we're going in a good direction already. Yeah. I just, I, mean, I, I hate to be so pessimistic, but you know, if you go in with low expectations after being let down so many fucking times, you, you can't be let down. All you can go is up if yeah. you're sitting on the floor, but I mean, that's that's ruined some good movies for me that I've went back and actually watched and liked movies like The Witch that I absolutely just went in way too high into the theaters and was let down. That's actually a fucking fantastic movie. But yeah, I mean, how many how many remakes and stuff, especially now? A lot. Everything that's happening with Blumhouse buying everything and putting trilogies out and David Gordon Green on to fuck it all up like a titty sucking fucking parasite. We've been let down a lot, so yeah. I, this was this was a huge sigh of relief. This is also a really awesome shot to see on a movie theater screen. It, it was. was great. Yeah, it was. Good. This is totally a movie theater movie. I'm glad that they didn't just stick with the um, HBO thing. I love that they started this whole movie out on this lake at a cabin in the mountains, and they kind of tied in in the end. But I love that we got this start because. That was a big thing that I was worried about. Like, you can't do Evil Dead in the city. Like, it's a, like, cabin in the middle of the woods with demons trapping you. Like, that's, how are you going to do that in the city? And to get this intro, and especially with it, with paying homage to the original, this had me feeling a little bit better. So next up, we meet our main character, Beth. And she is like this middle-aged, like, rock chick that works as a guitar tech for a touring band. Totally my kind of lady. So when we first meet her here, she is backstage at a concert where she discovers that when she pees on this little plastic stick, it informs her that she is with child. And Beth is very much a free bird, so this is devastating news. She then informs the band that she would be back later and leaves the venue to go see her sister who lives in the city. You know who Beth reminds me of? A shitty guitar tech that would run out right before a show. Stokely from the fac- faculty. I give Stokely vibes yeah, from I, her. I get that, yeah. Yeah, that's a good comparison. Actually, I, I don't know look, how you dug that shit up. I actually had <laughs> to go. I actually went to look and see. Is like, was it the same actress that played it? No, she's uh, got to be older now. Yeah, yeah, it's a different actress. 
But yeah, very similar vibes, kind of look thing going on. And they made her the whole like angsty goth girl. Yeah, too. yeah, totally this what is, Beth grows up to be. This is what she, yeah, <laughs> this is what she would grow up to be when she really embraced her. Well, no, they fucked it up because you remember when we covered well, the faculty forever you, ago? Yeah, and, she becomes, when she gets infected, she turns into like everybody else. Like, oh, at the oh, very at the end. end. Yeah, and She's yeah, like wearing yeah. this fucking little dress, like yeah. a white sweater. And I was like, that was literally one of the things I hated about that movie. Well, we just talked about in Urban Legends how that movie really shows you what society thought of like goth people at the yeah. time. Like yeah. they had a really, really bad view like Hollywood did on any type of like alternative or dark gothic girls. And <laughs> that's that's a good example of it too. The faculty, they're like Oh, it's happily ever after. She dropped her goth shit. She, she <laughs> they, they saved her from goth life. Uh, so Beth grabs a taxi and heads to her sister's place. We see that it is a dark and stormy night when she gets out of the car and looks up at this very large and creepy looking apartment building located on the outskirts of downtown L.A. The building really reminds me of the apartment building from Child's Play. Bro! No fucking way. <laughs> you wrote that too, huh? That's literally exactly in my notes. I'm like, I don't know why, but this building kind of reminds me of the apartments from the original Child's Play. That's exactly what I wrote. Yeah. What's, what is the chances of that? I don't of know, all the man. fucking buildings in the world <laughs> that I don't know. we would pick that up. Has, I think it's the shot. It's the like, shot, It's man. the shot when it looks up at it. It's, it's on the corner. It's got those windows on the corner. Yeah, definitely... It was very much like a slightly taller version of the building from Jod's play. So next up, we meet Beth's sister's family, who are going to be our main characters throughout the rest of this movie. And I'm going to run through them all like real quick so we know who everybody is. So first, we have Ellie, who is Beth's sister and mother to the kids in this story. She appears to be the more responsible one compared to Beth. But she has recently become a single mother of three after her husband up and left a few months back, opting to only pay her child support and refusing to help her with the kids. She also appears to be a tattoo artist by trade. Next, we have Ellie's oldest son, Danny. He's like, I don't know, 17 or something and very into music and DJing. He's got like this whole DJ vinyl record setup stuff in his room, which Becomes really important later on. Then we have his sister, Bridget, who is, I don't know, 16 or 17, something too. And she's like really into being a justice warrior, protest, and sticking it to the man, I guess. And last but not least, the youngest of the three, little Cassie, who is like, I don't know, eight or nine years old. She's fucking cool, though. I like her. She shoots my child. She, yeah. This is my child. She's literally, like, one of my favorite characters of the movie. She literally makes up a staff with a doll head cut off at at the end. And I'm like, that is is something my child would do. Yeah, I, um, it's so dumb, but I get a kick out of the Staffney every single time. (laughs) It's such a creative name. (laughs) But yeah, that's pretty much all of our main cast. And unfortunately... They are in an Evil Dead movie, so I don't think they're going to have much to look forward to, but it is a cool little family. So we get to see a little bit of the family dynamic here before things pop off, and it looks like they are all pretty close. Like, there's no real friction between any of them, mainly the siblings. Danny is in his room jamming out, pretending he is, like, DJing to a crowd of people. Cassie is cutting the head off a doll and attaching it to a wooden stick for a weapon, apparently. Bridget hears the doorbell ring and opens it to find her two neighbors, who are like about the same age, asking if she wants to come over and watch the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. This scene is like so small and meaningless to the movie, but it was like very nostalgic for me because it's like this teenage boy and his younger brother and they're trying to get some people to binge watch the Freddy movies on like a stormy weekend night. And it just takes me back to... The shit we would do. And especially when the kid is like, you know, even the shitty ones and the older ones, like there are no shitty ones because that's me. Like I'm like, well, there are some that are not as good, but there are no shitty ones. Yeah, that is, uh, except the remake, but Uh, that that one didn't didn't exist. We don't, we we grew up in a, a awesome childhood world where the shitty remake that doesn't have Robert England in it did not exist. Nope. 
So a little later on, Beth finally shows up where her and Ellie catch up a bit. Ellie informs her that the building is being condemned and that they have one month to move somewhere else. Beth is also surprised to hear about Ellie's husband walking out on the family when Ellie then informs her that she called Beth multiple times and left messages about the situation, which makes Beth feel like a piece of shit. Yeah, she didn't call her back for almost three months. Yeah, that's really like, shitty. And, but then when she has something happen to her, she that's the first place she goes. Yeah, it's within an of hour of finding out she is pregnant. You know, one thing with the the two sisters here and then the, the L and the kids, w- one thing I give them huge props for in this movie is not not only the characters, but the dialogue between them. This is a very real-feeling family. Like yeah. this is they they wrote these characters really genuine. Like it it feels like these characters could exist. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I look at the characters, because I remember saying this when we when we talked about on the best of episode that this was the first Evil Dead movie where I really liked the characters, and I was like, you know, I want to see them get fucked up, but at the same time, I kind of don't. And I think it's just because it reminds me of. Growing up in a, you know, you have a single parent, single parent and you. you're all kind of doing your own thing. And, but you, you know, you all still also have similar interests. You're kind of all in it together. And yeah, I think that's, I think that's what it is. It just reminds me of, of my time coming up. You know, we didn't grow up where, you know, we were all wearing fancy clothes and going to f- living in fancy places yeah, this, and all this stuff. This is very much, we were at not a dinner table eating family. And this is, this is very much, and you see that a lot in the movies, people going to dinner tables and eating and everything being organized. But in real life, there's a, a ton of single parents who don't like, don't have time to micromanage everything like that. Especially when you got three kids you're just trying to work and get by and and especially in her situation she's about to have to move and you know everything is is not micromanaged like everybody like you said everybody's doing their own thing i thought they conveyed this extremely well and i really like the mom from the from the oh, very beginning cuz she definitely gives that feeling of that single mom doing what she has to do to to get her kids taken care of yeah, the, the chemistry between the, the actors here is very believable of them being a, a family. Yeah, so great job for them. Uh, so while Beth and Ellie catch up for a bit, Ellie sends the kids to go pick up some pizza for dinner. And while they're out, Beth tries to apologize for putting her career ahead of her relationship with her sister. She then tells Ellie about the baby and how she may have fucked up her life. We also learn that Ellie and Beth have some kind of like issues with their mom. They never really say exactly what that is, but it is kind of hinted to a few times throughout the movie. It kind of, I kind of get like maybe she's an alcoholic or something kind of vibe or. Yeah, their mom sucked. Yeah, That's yeah. Just, they didn't give a backstory. Just, their mom just sucked. So a little bit later, we see the kids pull into the parking garage located on the first floor of the building with pizzas in hand. And as they are walking towards the elevator, a fucking earthquake began shaking the whole building. The kids attempt to run into the building, but a giant crack in the ground drives them back towards the car. They then take cover by a support beam until the quake is over. I would 100% still eat that pizza. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't leave the box. It got a little tossed around in the box. It's the same I'd, thing. I'd still fucking it's eat it. It's just rearranged different, but I'd, it's the same thing. Yep. Yeah. But if it's that bad, bust out the forks. Yeah. And roll it up. Well, they leave make it, it up a zone. They yeah, don't, even, they don't even bring it. And I would have totally brought that fucking pizza right up there with me. So while Bridget and Cassie attempt to salvage the pizza, Danny discovers, looking through this big crack in the ground, that there is an underground bank vault. He decides to go check it out, which I absolutely don't blame him because I would have totally done the same thing. I'm a grown adult and I'd still fucking, I'd still want to get down in there and look around. Yeah, my first thought was, yeah, I'm not going in that fucking hole right after an earthquake, but I'm definitely going to go back and check it. And then I thought, well, 17 me, I would have been in that hole immediately. And while down there, he finds all of these old letters and pictures of these priests. One of the priests is holding a very old looking book. He also comes across these old, like, vinyl records. 
which we know he's like into DJing. So, of course, he's going to want to listen to those. And as he is putting this stuff in his backpack, he starts to hear some odd sounding voices. When he turns to look around, a full size crucifix almost falls and hits him. He then starts looking around the rest of the vault when he discovers like a hundred little crucifixes hanging from the ceiling above this big concrete tomb. Bro, I would have 100% thought I just found like soup, some super important religious person's Oh, grave. yeah, their body. Yeah, yeah, for sure. As he uses his light to examine the tomb, he notices that the earthquake caused it to break at the bottom and leave a nice size hole for him to look into. He then pulls out something wrapped in a burlap sack from the tomb, and as he unfolds the sack, we see that it is a very old book with these, like, veins running all over it, and these long, sharp claws holding the book closed. It fucking looks so cool. I love this book. It does. It does look... I love the teeth. The, the yeah. teeth keeping it closed. I thought that was a... a, a Great addition. Yeah. yeah. Good, good addition. Meanwhile, back upstairs, we see Ellie and Beth freaking out over the kids still not being back after the quake. They attempt to call but can't get any reception on their phones. Ellie then knocks on her neighbor's door to ask for help. The first neighbor named Gabe comes out to talk to Ellie and agrees to help her find the kids. She's like, can I borrow your car to go look for them? And he's like, how about I drive you? Which yep, is totally that believable. Been me. Totally yeah. believable. So while Gabe grabs his keys, we then meet the second neighbor, an older gruff man named Mr. Fonda, which I want to point out because I have seen so many people that like dislike this movie. They bitch about this part, uh, not this part, but they bitch about something in the movie and they talk about the wood chipper. Why is there a wood chipper in downtown LA apartment building? So this is this guy's wood chipper. Like, it literally has his fucking name on the side of it. It's like con called Fonda's Tree Trimming Service or something. And obviously, you know, he works, does that for a job, and then he parks his truck in his apartment building. So, yeah, it makes sense for the wood chipper to be there. Because I've seen so many people try to say that that doesn't make any sense. But it does make sense if you know this character's name. Yeah, um, you, you would think... If you're going to go on the internet and trash a movie because of something, you would actually look into it or pay attention to the movie. <laughs> not, but, not in today's time. Yeah, <laughs> uh, But that, that was a good catch. That's something I never looked at. So that was a really good catch. But right as Gabe and Ellie are about to go searching for the kids, the elevator dings and the doors open and all three of them are safe. So later on, we see Danny showing Bridget the book he found, claiming that he thinks it may be worth money. But Bridget disagrees claiming that there is probably a reason why a creepy-ass book like that was locked in a vault. Danny then attempts to open it by prying the claws on the side apart, but it doesn't work and one of the claws pricks his finger, causing him to bleed. We then see a couple of drops of his blood drip onto the cover of the book, and the book quickly absorbs it like a evil sponge. It is a fucking evil... Uh... Sponge. Sponge. What, what's the... <laughs> fuck it. It's an evil sponge. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to think of this fucking famous smiley face fucking sponge. Scrub daddy? Scrub daddy. It's an evil scrub daddy. That's what it is. <laughs> With that, the claws... <laughs> the claws is kind of an scrub evil sponge. Scrub me, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were on Shark Tank. They that's were. how they got famous. I think they're the most successful people that's ever been on Shark Tank. That's oh, the only reason say I know most that. Most successful sponge people. <laughs> say, well... There's not a lot of probably true. <laughs> it's like a just a mass influx of people with different shaped sponges. If you need to clean up blood, just buy a bunch of scrub daddies. Soak that shit right up. No, no, you need Mr. Clean Magic Erasers for that. You know what? I, I want to bring this up since we we don't ever talk about scrub daddy, so let's let's throw it out there. <laughs> I've seen that they have Halloween scrub daddies uh, that come that are coming out soon. Nice. Like little vampires and pumpkins and stuff. And I was like, mm, I'm with that. Yeah. Well, so go get your Halloween scrub daddy before I, Halloween comes. I will be doing that. Yep. Uh, it's, it's weird how we got to the, we circled around to that. And with that, the claws release its tight grip from the book and allow Danny and Bridget to access the old creepy dried out pages. 
Danny then begins eagerly flipping through the pages of the book where he sees drawn images of terrible things like demons killing people and stuff coming out of people's mouths and, you know, your typical book of the dead stuff. The pages, the pages look really old in this one. They're a lot darker. Like, uh, very, very, very aged. I always pay close attention to the insides of the books. I always love the art. I wish that they were shown more throughout the movie. I know that they always reference back to them later on in the movie. But, yeah, I thought this one looked a little more aged. The the ink was a little darker on it. But the fucking art, and one thing about the art, and I think the director talked about this, is they wanted to fill every bit of available space on those pages. I can see that. Yeah, yeah that's, that's why thing there's that. like so much drawn on each page. So I went looking for somebody to make this book because I, I have I have one, but I don't have this one. And I found somebody who made a exact replica of it, including every fucking page in the book. Now that I would 220 bucks. And he's gonna he's gonna be getting my two hundred bucks for sure. Yeah, I was about to say two hundred. If if all the pages are are right, yeah, uh, I would pay that. Yeah, you know what? Which one I would really love to get with the pages? I would probably buy before this one is the two thousand thirteen. That's a good one too. Because that that's my favorite inside the book. Mm. Uh, out, out of out of all three of them, the they used a lot of red and black ink. But the drawings, the the scratched out pen drawings that are in that book, I f- feel like look the best. Yeah, I am. Uh, I would love to eventually have them all uh, you know with what? the stuff inside the books. But I was about to ask you this, you know, in like two minutes when you get to this part after all this happens. But I'll go ahead and ask you now. So obviously they talk about in this movie, they give, you know, we have the backstory in Army of Darkness. There's, there's three books and this movie is the third. You have the original Evil Dead book. You had the 2013 as the second, and this is the third. So, out of all three Necronomicons, how would you rank them? Oh, I don't know. And that's that's <laughs> counting that's counting outside and inside, like overall. Yeah, I don't know because I don't. It's it's hard to say because I don't off the top of my head remember the insides of all each one. And I, I feel like my pictures for you know what we need. We need an assistant. We need that guy that does like big podcast, like Joe Rogan's. Like, hey, look this shit up for yeah. me real quick. We need one of those. I would love anybody wants to work for for, for us. free. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, man. Like, and I, I, I really don't know the insides well enough to say for sure. I would like to. I would like to look into it though, and and find out. Well, I'll ask you again when we covered the 2013 remake. Yeah, which I want to cover, but we just watched it for your birthday on the on our movie theater screen in the, in the backyard. Yeah, it, it, it's really hard for me. I think the the inside by far the coolest ones, the 2013 for me. Then I would put this one, and then probably the original. As far as outside, the 2013, it's. I think this the cover of this one's better. You, you like it better? I like the cover of this one better, but not as much as the original because I love the backstory that they give the original in the other movies, which is like this demon's face cut off and wrapped around this book. Look yeah. wise, yeah, I mean, they're probably pretty close, but w- with the whole like it being an actual face. I, I think that's that's probably the best one overall. I I can't hardly say that. Probably probably 2013. I would love if you could combine like the claws or teeth or whatever from the side of this one to the face of the original one. That would really be probably the yeah the best outcome. You could do that, and you could cut the face up and have it stitched together, like yeah. in different pieces, like the 2013 book was. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah, and uh, I love the stitch. How I've, like you could see the stitching. Yeah, because I think the original was stitched, but it was it was stitched in like black yarn, so you couldn't see it as well. It's mostly just a face. Like the face is is drawn over. Like you don't yeah, get maybe. a lot of stitching. You definitely the 2013 is only like human flesh, but stitched together in a bunch of places. 
And then this one is like flesh with these like veins running through it, but it has these awesome teeth that hold it together. I think they're all three really fucking awesome. And each one of them has unique, unique very, stuff with it. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they, they did that on purpose, actually. You know, he talked about this book in particular with giving it its own personality because all three of them kind of call back to the same demons, but they each book has its own personality. So Bridget immediately gets creeped out and slams the book shut, ordering him to put it back by the morning. Once she leaves the room, Danny then pulls out the records and places them on his turntable. So once the record starts playing, we hear a priest named Marcus Littleton, who was the library keeper at St. Patrick's Cathedral, addressing his church about a book that was discovered by overseas missionaries. So he believes it to be one of the three fabled volumes of the Notorum de Manto, a.k.a. the Book of the Dead. He then says that his tests reveal that the book is made from cured human flesh and passages inked in human blood. And today, he seeks church approval to translate the book and discover what spiritually spiritual mysteries the pages hold. Boy, and the nope. church people are fucking pissed. I don't blame them. I'm not a church person, and I'd immediately be like, nope. Yeah, this is nope. this is one of the few times you'll ever hear me say that the church was right. The church was right. Y'all done fucked up. Yeah. They left this shit alone. So we then hear that the church members are all yelling, basically saying, fuck no. We even hear one member yell, destroy it. It's called the Book of the Dead for a reason. Which, by the way... This is actually Bruce Campbell that says this. And the director has went back and said that he believes it to be Ash Williams who got stuck in another time. Yeah, so, so I had had heard that that was Bruce Campbell. But I, I, I think the theory is really interesting with him potentially having gone back to this time and tried to destroy this version of the book then. I think it's a really, really cool theory. Yeah, I um I love that they threw that in there and it it opens up a, a whole nother branch possibility of what what story we could tell with, with Ash. I don't know if we're gonna get Ash anymore, but No we but, might. But they could continue to reference these yeah. like they did in this to kind of build a backstory. They could have them in other recordings, they do more on this book. They could have it talked about. They they could do some cool stuff with it. So, yeah, very cool theory. So after that record ends, Danny then grabs the other one and places it on the record player. And this time we hear Littleton by himself, where he explains that basically the church said, fuck no, don't translate that shit. So him and two other priests decide to do it in secret because that's totally not a bad idea. No, he says they got kicked out of the church. Oh, the I didn't church, catch that. Yeah, the church literally kicked them out. They got Good. banned. They got banned from the church. I the mean, church is like, we want no part of this shit. Yeah, I mean, it's literally a book of how to summon demons, and why would you think that that is a gr- a good idea? Yeah, I've heard that a lot of people see the Necronomicons as a metaphor for hum- humanity's one of their biggest demons, which is curiosity. No, no, and yeah. every you know everybody who gets into these books, there's uh, every movie, there's somebody there telling them, hey, like you shouldn't fuck with this, shouldn't touch it. Yeah. It was there for a reason, but human curiosity always overcomes somebody in the group, and it ends up getting everybody killed. So he then says that what they have translated so far explains that the book has the power to contact evil spirits that exist beyond the thin veneer of our world. And while he is explaining this, we see Ellie carrying a box of her ex-husband's things to throw out. She gets into the elevator and heads down to the trash area. So Littleton then informs us that the date he is recording this is January 24th of 1923. And he is going to read the motherfucking incantations to summon an entity from the book. Why would you ever think that you should do that? But more importantly, why the fuck would you record it? I don't know. They re- it was the original. They did the recording. The 2013 wasn't. That guy actually, he was too curious. He actually, it was like hidden in the yeah. meaning of the, but he had to like take the paper and scratch. But yeah, 
you you probably shouldn't record that. No. I, I I get that you want to you want to record this for history. Skip the actual reading the words. Yeah. Like if you have all these warnings in this book, like you know this is to in, incantation to bring the dead back. Let's, let's just not record this part. I it is interesting though. I I never picked up on the date. So this is a hundred years later. Yeah. This is what this takes place. I I never realized it was nineteen twenty three. So Danny then tries to stop the record player, but it doesn't work. It's kind of just playing on its own at this point. And then we get that classic shot of the POV of the demon just flying down the street towards the building. Danny tries to pull the needle from the record, but gets shocked. And he then sees the pages of the book just like wildly flipping on their own. The demon then enters the parking garage and the door opens to reveal poor old Ellie just standing there where she gets fucking blasted back into the elevator as it takes off back to the top of the building. Didn't she just tell her kids not to take the elevator after an earthquake? most certainly did. We then get a quick shot of the book that shows a drawing of a woman being held down by vines. Does that ring any bells? I'm pretty sure that the vines have occurred in the original. Then it happens, I'm pretty sure it happens in Evil Dead 2. And then we know it happens again in the 2013 remake, and we kind of got it again now. So yeah, this this scene right here you're about to talk about, I I loved the broken elevator cables. I th- I thought it was a a really it's a fresh, creative it's a, way, yeah, it's a fresh way to do what we yeah what we've seen. It's like an ode to yeah. to the original, you know, staying true to the Evil Dead story, but. You know, obviously there's no vines in this apartment building and they were able to do it with broken elevator cables and they left, they left the, uh, the sexy part off, sexual stuff. I think that's only in the original one. No, it's in the 13 too. Oh, is it? Yeah. It's it's in the 13, but it just creeps up her leg and up Mm. her dress. It's not as like crazy as the original. The original definitely leaves more of a, a stamp on your mind. Did but yeah, I love that they did this. Did you notice Ellie has tattoos of vines going up her arms? I did. I did because I thought Ellie was the most untattooed tattoo artist I may have ever seen. Because yeah. all she that's the only tattoo you really see yeah. on her arms. So Ellie then wakes up on the elevator floor where she finds the door stuck shut. She starts getting pushed around by this demon when suddenly an electrical wire slithers down from the above and wraps around her neck. We then start seeing all these different like cables wrapping around her arms and her legs, pulling her in all these like unnatural positions. It starts snapping her limbs and wrapping so tight we see blood running down her arms and legs. She then screams in pain and the lights go out. Yeah, um... This is really cool because it starts like snapping her limbs in all these like d- different directions. And it's, it's really, if you would like to put yourself in that situation, that'd be a 100% fucking nightmare. You know, you don't even have like somebody to fight off or anything. Like, you don't even know what the fuck is going on. You got wires coming to life and just snapping your fucking body all different directions. Yeah, you're fucked. It's wild, man. You're fucked. It's, it's, don't, don't ever get hung up in an elevator. It's, it's no. Rough. Or an evil elevator. So now we see that the whole building has lost power, and Beth and the kids are wondering where Ellie has went. And while Bridget and Danny light candles throughout the apartment, we see a zombie like Ellie walk into the front door. She walks straight to the kitchen and cuts on the burner while Beth and the kids try to talk to her. She begins throwing eggs into a pan where you can see like, you see like blood mixed in with the egg yolk. This is a really, really cool touch. She then starts telling them that she had a dream where they were all together having a perfect day and all she could think about is how she wanted to kill them all and climb inside of their bodies and be one big happy family. Yeah, cut you all open and climb inside your body and and with like with which you mentioned with the really creepiness of the blood mixed in with the eggs. And this movie, they did a really good job of making it extremely unsettling. But I, I'll say, as far as the demonites go, the dialogue in this movie is fucking savage. 
it is one thing I really it's like a little touch that I really like is you know it's maybe because it's been a hundred years the demon struggles with certain words like melody like it has trouble trying to get out the word melody and it almost has to stop and think of how to say the word and it, it almost makes me wonder is it just because it hasn't spoke you know human language in, in so long but this scene man everything about this scene right here is creepy it is uh, and there's a lot of scenes like this like I said with, with the dialogue of just being super unsettling like the darkest part of your mind comes up with this shit. I thought they did a great job. Yeah, this guy wrote this while stuck in his apartment during COVID. Yeah, so... I was going to say, thank God that, for COVID. <laughs> but, I mean, it makes sense, though, because the movie takes place strictly inside an apartment. Yeah. And, That's I mean, it was point. a really good way to turn, you know, this situation that the real world's going through, that you're stuck, you know, quarantining in your place forever... And turn it into this, man, a a great movie with a really great dialogue and setting and everything. So she then starts like Joker laughing while Beth and the kids are like, what the fuck? Ellie then turns to face them and kind of comes back to herself for a moment. She then looks at Beth and says, it is in me before collapsing to the ground and doing some like weird bone cracking contortionist shit. She then like pukes up about 20 gallons of demon semen. Then looks at Beth and says, don't let it take my babies. She then crashes face first into the puke-soaked floor. Yeah, Ellie spent way too much time at the glory hole, apparently. she it's, I've never seen this much white stuff come out of a, a, a demonite. Yeah. Danny and Beth attempt to take her to the hospital, but quickly find that the elevator is destroyed and the staircase has crumbled from the earthquake. So at this point, it seems like Ellie is dead because that's Deadite's favorite go-to trick. Her neighbors help Beth get Ellie's body into bed until they are able to get some kind of help. So Gabe then comes up with a plan to use the fire escape to go get some help. But Mr. Fonda reminds him that the only access is through apartment 82, which is locked up because no one lives there. And they agree to use some of Mr. Fonda's tools to try to break in. Why would the fire escape only be accessible from one apartment? That's weird. Yeah, that was a COVID writer's block that he just never overcame. I have never lived in a building with a fire escape that I at least know of. And I don't know if that's normal. Because, I mean, if there's a fire and I, you can't get to the fire escape because the other person's got their door locked, like, how does that work? I, I feel like I'm... I'm extremely confident in the fact that that is is not by code and that is not how it works in real life. Honestly, a fire escape after an earthquake too is really sketchy because that's all like thin ass metal. Yeah, it's less sketchier than or less sketchy than going taking the elevator and getting yeah, wrapped up by broken elevator cables. Yeah, I, I just there's there's no way they're building buildings like this. Well, I mean, the building did get condemned, so maybe that's like, maybe they just didn't. Why even put one? If you're only going to like, it is, does that guy pay extra rent to have a fire escape to just for him? Well, you would think, because no one lives there now, it's empty. You would think that because the only access to the fire escape, you, they would just leave the door unlocked in case there was a fire, but yeah, I don't know. So while they are doing that, we see Beth kind of saying her last goodbyes to Ellie. But this is the Evil Dead and not a fucking Hallmark movie, so we know shit is about to go down. So Beth then gets a voicemail from Ellie where she is begging for help, claiming that she is burning it alive. And when Beth turns around, a very dead looking Ellie is sitting straight up. With her and the kids now believing that she is alive, they place her very hot body into a bathtub full of cold water, hoping it will cool her down. But Ellie begins convulsing before springing up and sticking to the ceiling like Spider-Man. She then crawls around on the wall and lets out a very loud scream that literally shatters glass and boils the bath water. She then drops back down into the boiling water and when she emerges, we see she now has glowing silver demon eyes. Danny calls out to her when she then smiles real big and with a very deep demonic voice, says the famous line, Mommy's with the maggots now. 
That shit's fire. That was That's good a line. fire ass line. I remember seeing that in the trailer and being like, "Oh man, I'm so excited." Yeah, that that's a good line. That's another example of just the, the awesome dialogue from the Demonite. I thought the fucking voicemail thing was really good too. Yeah, like, to to be laying next to your sibling who you think is dead, and then a voicemail that, that you obviously ignored starts playing on your phone and then you hear her like screaming like she's still in there and she's burning alive in hell it's like oh man that's super creepy well i got a question for you i know that you typically hate the you know how they do the digital voice changing for possession movies i know you typically rail on those i'm railing Uh, on it you're not not a huge fan of it in this movie either not no i'm not not the digital voice also the in the scene the bathtub scene and when she comes out of the bathtub which we're about to talk about i hated the fucking cgi body movements and body contortions Mm. i i feel like the movie is so much scarier without them like when you have somebody actually like even if you uh the the possession of hannah grace we learned they actually got a contortionist in there she was so good it almost looked like cgi but the they do these like really quick like her body moves and and it's obviously CGI the way that she moves it a couple times like she like almost twitches why her body's contorting when she's walking and I'm like the best example is like the the original Exorcist how scary that is because it feels real like it's it's something realistic when they had these CGI moments in here it's like. Yeah, that's scary, but that's you, you. That would never happen. Like even if you were in this scenario, you know, computer generated reality wouldn't just start happening. And the voice, the voice, I'm not as hard on in this movie. It wasn't as bad, but I, I am not a fan. I like the way The Exorcist did it when they make a woman relapse, drinking and oh, smoking yeah. cigarettes to to do the voice. That's that's the OG shit. I mean, I could have, I really could have did without the contortion stuff and all that stuff. But I actually really like the voice in in this movie. All of them, you know, they're all great for me. So. Yeah, like I said, it's not as bad in this movie because some movies it's very obvious. I mean, it's well, very, they always kind of do the standard one in most of the possession movies. Sounds but, like it's coming through a fucking microphone. But or this a one, I, but this one, I felt like each character had their own individual creepy, creepy voice. Which makes sense because we'll know from their eyes that they're all kind of different demons. Yeah. Yeah, not not as, as hard on the, the voices in this, but I, I'm still not a fan. But the CGI body movements is what really got me. And there was a couple CGI moments. When she jumps up on the ceiling, there's a couple like CG. There was three or four things I noticed that was very obvious CGI. I don't mind CGI when you have to use it. Like if it's something that has to be in there. But it, it, if it's not necessary, don't put it in there. Like, it's, if you're not using it to make a practical effect better or to do something that's obviously not possible to do in a practical way, just don't, just don't put it in there. So she then walks towards Beth and Danny while holding a very large piece of glass. Danny runs off to the other side of the room as Deadeye Ellie stabs Beth in the hand. Bridget then tries to intervene when Ellie then turns around and tells her that she is finally free from all of their titty-sucking parasites. That's cold. That is good shit, man. Like I said, this is savage, especially towards the kids, man. This demon hates kids. No, oh, for sure. He's, it's he or she, it, it definitely does not want to have kids when it gets older. She then leaps across the room, tackling Bridget to the ground, while grabbing her tattoo gun and putting it to Bridget's cheek. You think she was trying to tattoo titty sucking parasite on Bridget's face? She was definitely no, no, not on her face, on her on her eye. Yeah. Well, she like tra- goes for she the does. eye. She turns her head and she just kind of well, just lets it rip on her fucking cheek anyway. It well, th- I I never picked this up before or the the first time I watched this movie, but she dips the tattoo gun in her blood. Yeah. And then to put her blood, and that's how she gets infected mm-hmm. is through this tattoo. And I thought that was just a really, really cool detail they added in there. And then the eye, I'm sure you're going to mention the eye that happened right after this. 
but God, man, that is like, it is, it is so cringy even watching that needle almost hit the eye. And yeah. as bad as you want to see it, you don't want to see it at the same time. Yeah, eye things are just like, they creep me out. Yeah, anything with eyes and needles are, is, is rough. And it's one of those things where, like, we can watch Terrifier and watch a lady get cut in half, like, completely, and that cut in half the unconventional way. Uh, the hot dog style yeah. instead of hamburger. But, uh, and we, we're fine with that. But then there's sometimes there's little things that something will happen to somebody's eye or their hand, and it's just like, it makes you kind of cringe. You remember, I was like a year or two ago when I had found out in Jason Takes Manhattan when she's like on the boat or whatever and he comes through that little porthole window and he's like, he's got her. And then I had found out from the actress that she was freaking out in real life because there's a piece of glass that's about to stab her in the eye. And then you go back and you watch that and you actually see the little piece of glass like on the verge of stabbing her in the eye while she's like struggling from the actor who's playing Jason. And, like, now every time I see that scene, I'm like, oh, God, like, no. <laughs> I'm you, glad that she didn't get her fucking eye stabbed out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're going to do it in practical effects, I'm cool with that. But, yeah, let's, let's not stab well, it, actress's eyes out. Well, the, you think they would have kept it in the movie? <laughs> well, it was a total, you know, total accident because the, the fake glass just didn't break. It or just, the wood or something didn't break correctly. And... But they ran with it. They let it. They let it roll. You think if it would have stabbed her in the eye, you think they'd have kept it in there? I mean, I don't know. They kept that Brandon Lee getting shot, didn't they? I don't think they had the actual the know. scene of him getting shot. I've heard so much different versions about that. I I really don't know. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe they did. I don't. I I, I don't think. I think that we see that scene that he gets shot in, but the actual one where the guy gets hit and falls is not him. So yeah, I like think that's, that's it, what I've they heard. cut it after the shot and then kind of splice in the, the other guy in there. So while she is on top of Bridget about to like bite off her face, Danny comes out of the crowd with a steel chair laying Ellie out. But Bridget doesn't go for the three count. She just jumps up and gets the fuck out of there. Yeah, she 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 pulled the Vince McMahon. Yep, she she just got that. Well, I can't say that anymore because that's just shitting on somebody. <laughs> you can't say that anymore. He's the R. Kelly of wrestling now. It's <laughs> <laughs> worse, worse, way worse. I was far as well, not worse than R. Kelly because R. Kelly was doing that shit to kids, I think. But as as far as far as shitting on somebody and pissing on somebody, those are two different atmospheres in my head. Yeah, that's we, awful. We need Dave Chappelle to make a skit about that. <laughs> he he should do a skit where he's Vince McMahon. Yes. That would absolutely, be fucking 100%. hilarious. So Ellie gets back up and does this super cre- creepy eeny, meeny, miny, mo thing. When suddenly behind her, the neighbors Gabe and teenage boy. I don't really know his name. The guy from earlier. I didn't look at it. It's not important. It's not important. He's a Cheeto guy. That's That's pretty much it. Uh, But they walk in, and Ellie immediately rushes him, latching on and forcing him into the hallway. She lets out another loud scream before chomping into his fucking eyeball. He and Ellie fall to the floor with the two young neighbors watching in horror, when suddenly Ellie begins to choke. She then spits out the eyeball, sending it flying across the hallway and into the older boy's mouth and down his throat. I'm pretty sure... That that is from Evil Dead 2. That happens. I'm pretty sure that was CGI. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with that, though. Like, that's one of those things, obviously. Well, I don't know. I, I would prefer they shot it from further back. When, and just. But if you're going to follow the ball like that, yeah, you, you have to do CGI. However, what they didn't have to do in CGI was the guy getting his face bit or his eye. That initially is cgi but then when he falls against the wall and they show the up close that was definitely practical effects and it looked fucking awesome well i will say that i did see i don't think i really included it in here but i did see that the special effects team was actually talking about doing the movie and they said that the filming was incredibly fast for a movie like this a lot faster than normal they also filmed the movie in order but he said that they pretty much worked this 24-7, seven days a week. 
They said like they would film during the week and then the special effects team would go and work the weekends trying to create all of the practical effects. And it really would like burnt them out almost. They were having to go so hard, but they were really happy with the movie when it was done. They're really proud of it. So, you know, I just take stuff like that and maybe they just didn't have the time. Yeah. And it was just a really hard movie to shoot. And and another thing to add to that as as far as them not having the time is they actually built all these sets practical. Yeah, like they built them that, in, in and a that building. was one thing that they said they didn't want to do any like backdrop stuff unless they had to. They wanted like the elevator is a real built elevator and you know all the it, it filling up with blood and stuff all that shit's legit. These apartment scenes, all this stuff was practically built and that took a lot of a lot of their time too. Yeah. So yeah, I can what we get at the end of this movie, I can forgive. I can forgive these small little things because I'm sure that, you know, especially with them shooting that fast, it's probably incredibly difficult. There was even, you know, there's even reshoots and stuff too that you got to get done really quick. Something didn't come out right. But yeah. Big, it's, big it's, props to Lee Cronin for filming his fucking movie the way you should film a movie. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Gabe quickly bleeds to death in the hallway, and then like the teenage boy falls down, struggling to open his airway with his little brother by his side. Beth looks out the doorway and says, fuck this shit, as she slams and locks the front door. She's like, I'm not helping any of these guys. So Beth then looks out of the peephole to see Ellie kill the other young boy. I believe she rips his arms off. When suddenly Mr. Fonda shoots her with his shotgun, but that doesn't really work out too well because she then drags him towards the end of the hall and kills him somehow. While Deadeye Ellie is trapped in the hall, Beth attempts to yell for help out of the window, but it is now loudly storming. Bridget calls out Danny claiming that their mom now looks like the picture in the book, and Danny's like, damn, you're right. This causes Bridget and Danny to get into a fight when Beth then breaks it up, telling them they must stick together. Danny then decides to come clean and show Beth the book and the records. Bridget then heads to the kitchen, leaving a very freaked out Cassie sitting in the living room by herself when she starts hearing her mother singing to her from the hallway. You know a little kid cannot resist a demon's tricks, so of course like she's probably going to be opening the door. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, Bridget is attempting to do first aid on the cut to her face from the tattoo gun, but black veins suddenly sprout from the wound as she begins to hear a voice call her name. It's kind of reminding me of the black veins in Cheryl's hand when her hand gets taken over. Remember we talked about that before? Yeah, the, see, like the black veins is, is obviously touched up with CGI. I love that. Like That's something that Looks really cool. It is necessary. One thing I want to point out is the the peephole shot where all this stuff's going on. So the guy with the eye jumps back up to the peephole and she slits his throat. Yeah, and I yeah. think it's it's my second favorite kill, which is why I brought it back up. Uh, we get this really awesome fish eye shot because it's shot through the peephole. But the throat, the throat slit was was definitely a practical effect. Even like part of his throat starts coming out. Thought it was fucking awesome looking. And props to the cinematography for shooting it that way. That was really cool. Uh, Yeah, before I forget, I'll go ahead and just throw this out there now. So a lot of the people that actually worked on Ash vs. Evil Dead got selected to do this movie because of, you know, how good of a job. And they were already really familiar with everything. The cinematographer is... um from ash vs. evil dead so a lot of those cool fish eye shots and just kind of really unique shots were stuff that he had done on the show the set designer and stuff who built all the sets and all that he is from ash vs. evil dead as well so you you brought up that cool fish eye shot and that just reminded me of we got a bunch of people that were already used to working on evil dead stuff in this movie yeah the the cinematography they, they did. I thought that was a really cool shot. This is a really dark movie, so they're able to do a lot of cool stuff with lighting, too, which I, I thought they took advantage of. So Dark Black Blood then pours from her nose and eyes. And meanwhile, back at the front door, Cassie attempts to talk to Ellie, asking her what is wrong. Ellie tells her that she was just sad about Cassie's dad leaving her, but everything is fine now because he came back and they are in love again. This scene reminds me so much of the scene in Toy Story. <laughs> Where they're trapped in Sid's room 
And they throw he throws like the Christmas lights over to like Andy's toys. And they're like, but you killed Buzz. And he's like, no, Buzz is right here. And he's got <laughs> Buzz's arm. And he's like, just let me come over. And, you know, it's, just, it's the same thing here. She's like, your dad's right here. Yeah. And then she does that weird, like, open the door for mom and dad. She, she should have pulled one of the guy's <laughs> arms off yeah. and, like, pulled it, put it over her shoulder. Like, yeah. oh, your dad's right here. Yeah. But, yeah, she pretends that their dad has come back and he, Cassie should let them in. Ca- Cassie is slinky dog yep. in that scene. Pretty much. See, he's telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so... Wow, where the fuck am I at? <laughs> <laughs> Who ever thought God Evil Dead and Toy Story would have a scene Toy in Toy Stories and Sponge Daddy books. <laughs> yeah, so... Anyway, yeah, so Cassie opens the door and Ellie immediately grabs her throat. Thankfully, Beth and Danny hear this and run to save her. Danny gets Cassie free as Beth slams the door back closed. She was... That demon was one arm in the fuck out of that kid. Yeah. Oh, so while this is going on, Bridget, who is still in the kitchen, attempts to drink some water, but starts choking a little bit, eventually coughing up a big cluster of black worms. After sending Danny and Cassie into the bedroom, Beth decides to check on Bridget in the kitchen, and when she walks in, she finds Bridget standing on the countertop with her back turned to her. I would be like, god damn it, what kind of fucked up creepy shit is about to happen now? Because you know. You know, walking in there, you're just like, this is, this isn't normal. No. So Beth then walks up to Bridget and asks her what she is doing. When we then start to hear the sound of glass crunching. You can see it in Beth's face. She's just like, fuck. Yeah, I wouldn't even ask what she was doing. I would have, I would have knew something was, I would have probably just backed my way out of the room. But, uh, yeah, she's definitely like, oh, oh, shit. So Bridget then turns around to reveal that she is eating a wine glass like a fucking apple. And she has black veins running all over her face. Bro, the glass, as she's swallowing it, and then they they show the shot of the glass poking back through her skin from the inside. God, it was fucking awesome. I thought one of the coolest, not the coolest, but one of the coolest practical effects of the whole movie. It just, somebody eating glass already, like, puts you on edge. Like, oh, super yeah. creepy. And then for them to add that in there. So it's, that's fantastic. Bridget then looks right at Beth, revealing her glowing yellow eyes, saying in a demonic voice, I gotta kill the creepy crawlies that I got inside my tummy. She then spits glass and blood in her face, causing Beth to trip and fall. Uh, yeah, I think this whole scene, especially where she like says that shit, it's just so creepy and so good. Yeah, the the deem, demon taking another cheap shot at the kids. Yeah. This time the unborn baby. Deadite Bridget then crawls towards her as Beth attempts to get away. Bridget then grabs a cheese grater and begins shredding the skin on the back of Beth's leg, causing Beth to scream out in pain. Bro, I love the look on Bridget's face. Whenever she uses this cheese grater, With, like it's like a look of curiosity and excitement. I think and it's the same look that I had on my face when I'm like, <laughs> they're going to use a cheese grater. Like we're going to get to see them use a cheese grater on this on a leg. It I literally had the same look on my face as she did. In the, it's like the demons like, oh, a cheese grater. I've never seen what one of these will do. Yeah, that's literally what <laughs> I was about to these say. these a hundred years ago. <laughs> I was going to say that very thing. Of like, I think it's the same look we had on our faces. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lee Cronin talked about how when he wrote the movie, he just kind of looked around shit in his apartment, like what would be cool to kill somebody with or fuck somebody up with, and cheese grater it was. That was, that was a good call. Yeah. Yeah, cheese grater in an Evil Dead movie, sign me up. So Beth then decks Deadite Bridget in the face with a cooking pot, temporarily knocking her out. Danny then comes running into the room where Bridget wakes up and begins chasing him. They end up in Cassie's room where she is standing there holding her Staphne weapon that she made earlier in the movie. Bridget then spots her in the room and rushes after her. Cassie backs up into the corner holding Staphne out as a defense when suddenly the sharp end of the staff goes into Bridget's mouth and through the back of her head. Cassie then opens her eyes to see the deadite version of her sister is deep throating her fucking broom handle weapon. Bridget kind of just turns and walks around the room with the piece of wood still stuck in her head. She then grabs the end of it and slowly pulls it back through her mouth, which, by the way, sounds 
So fucking gross. The sound guys did an amazing job with that. It, it just like grosses me out every time I hear it. Old Stephanie came in clutch. Hell yeah. So after she pulls it out, she just like falls to the floor, presumably dead. We know that's, you know, not true, but she's dead for now. And her eyes turn like this fucking red orange color when this happens. It's like, it's like she's fully, like the, the demon has fully got her like that. She is fully dead now and the demon has full control over the body. I, I don't know if that's exactly why they put it in there at that moment, but the eyes turn when she falls to the floor. Really cool. You don't see very many like orange red eyes. Yeah. So Danny ends up tying Bridget's body up in a sheet when Beth then tells him that she wants to hear the vinyl record. Next, we see her connecting the record player to a bunch of batteries because, remember, the the building has no power. Once she gets it all working, she hands Danny a knife and sends them out into the living room. She places the record on the player and begins to listen. We then hear Littleton's voice again and, oh, by the way, the guy who does Littleton's voice is the same guy who plays Mr. Fonda. Mm. Same dude. So anyway, yeah, we hear his voice again and he begins to explain that it has been two nights since he recorded the incantation from the book and in a much fancier way of saying it, he admits he royally fucked up. He then says that he is making this final recording as a warning to the next person who finds the book. How would a fucking warning at the end of the record help anyone out? Like, after they've already played the incantation part. Well, he's probably hoping that somebody puts this on before they play the first two. It, it's, is it on the same record? It's on the third. There's a whole third yeah, there's record. A whole, yeah, he's probably hoping somebody just skips to the end. That's Skips yeah, skip that, to the just, end. Like, just destroy the record, you the one you recorded. Like, you should just destroy that. You, you should, yeah, I would be embarrassed. I would be like, oh, man, I got a, at least number one. Like, the church people telling them, like, you're wrong. Like, destroy that shit. I'd be like, I'm going to get rid of that one. Yeah, I, this I, is just going like, to make me look dumb. It just doesn't make sense to put a warning on it after you've already summoned the demon. You um, should have, like, wrote, like, listen to this first. Start start with part <laughs> That's three. That's what I'm saying. Like, write it on the fucking cover. Like, don't play this one. Well, <laughs> it, you know, I will say, this guy goes through a ton of shit that he is, he's describing, like, leading them, setting them on fire, cutting them up, and he can't do anything. And this is, like, his last ditch, like, making this. The guy was going through a lot of shit, and this guy was probably pretty badass to, to get through all, all the shit he did to these demonites. I was thinking they could do a story that takes place in 1923 of, him, yeah. of his story and do an Evil Dead timepiece. Oh, I totally watched that. That would be awesome. So he then explains that while him and the other two priests were like fucking around with the book, the demon possessed Cortez first and began rotting him from the inside out. They attempted to pray the demon out of him, but it just made fun of them and it didn't work. Uh, which is funny. So right after that, it possessed the other priest, which then caused Littleton to call for more priests for help, which allowed the entity to possess more people. It's like evil COVID. So Littleton then says that he tried to end the curse by attempting to kill all of the other priests. He led them to a woodshed and set them on fire, but they just danced in the flames. He then tries to bury their bodies in consecrated earth, and again, that doesn't work. He then cut them up into pieces, but apparently the pieces came after him. So he has finally locked himself in a cellar and decided that there is no way to stop them. All these all these uh, demons trying to get inside these priests. Oh, how the tables have turned. Yeah, it's ironic. Uh, while Beth is listening to all of this, we see Deadite Bridget sneak up behind Danny and Cassie. Danny throws Cassie to the floor in order to save her. Bridget slams into Danny's body, causing him to stick the big-ass butcher knife into her. She then slams Danny into the kitchen counter, stabbing him in the arm with the knife. While this is going on, we see that Ellie has crawled into the vents and snuck into Danny's room, where Beth is still listening to the record. After Danny gets stabbed in the arm, Deadite Bridget then pukes like a gallon of blood into his face. She then pulls the knife from his arm and stabs it directly into his chest. Before he dies from his wounds, 
he is able to use an aerosol can and the flame from the burner to set Bridget on fire. Next, we see Deadeye Ellie attack Beth in the bedroom. Beth then gets yeeted out into the living room like a rag doll, where she finds Danny slowly dying from the butcher knife in the chest. Bridget floating around the corner with the sheet over her head. In the background, awesome. right before it happens, super creepy. Like, she super even, awesome like, cinematography. I mean, even the puke scene, when she's puking the blood, she still has the sheet on. Uh-huh. And he finally, like, pulls it off. And the, yeah, I don't know why, but her having the sheet over her, when and not even walking, she just floats around this fucking mm-hmm. corner, makes it so much more creepy. It's like the demons don't even need to see, have, like, human eyes to see through. Like, they're just completely... Controlling this body with full awareness of what's around him. I don't know why exactly. It just, it was so much more creepy than her just walking around the corner. Yeah, it's in the, in the blankets like soaked in her blood from Staphne and all that shit. Yeah. We, we, we must have missed the demon semen part for her. Maybe it happened with the sheet on. We just, if she's a kid, they just didn't put it in. They're like, we know what this looks like. We're just doing an ode to the original. So, young Cassie is terrified and has resorted to hiding under the couch next to where Danny is laying on the floor. Ellie pins down Beth to the floor and after some shit talking, goes to rip out Beth's unborn baby from her stomach. Good God, that is dark. That is, that is, that is dark. But right before this happens, Cassie slides a big ass pair of scissors over to Beth where Beth then uses them to stab Ellie right up her nose and into her brain, temporarily killing her. And there's the scissors that Ellie was looking for in the beginning of the movie. She found them. They were in her face. I thought, Ellie's waits in hell for you and your unborn baby. Another savage line. Cold. Cold Cold-blooded. So Beth and Cassie then attempt to make their escape. They tried to get into apartment 82 in order to access the fire escape, but failed to get the door open. Deadeye Ellie then pulls the long pair of scissors from her nose and goes looking for Beth. Beth grabs Mr. Fonda's shotgun in order to blow apartment 82 door open, but Ellie attempts to attack her first. Beth then uses the shotgun to blow off one of Ellie's legs and one of her arms. When I was writing this, I paused it right at the leg being blown off looked good even paused like that yeah good job with that we then see mr fonda awaken to reveal his possessed glowing yellow eyes he tries to grab beth's leg but she's not having any of that shit she like beats him to death with the fucking end of the gun and while a pretty fucked up ellie lays on the ground in the hallway we then see the deadite versions of bridget and danny come out of the apartment and kneel beside ellie They all three look at Beth and Cassie and just like laugh like a bunch of fucking creepy weirdos. Then we see all of the dead bodies of the mutilated neighbors come alive and chant dead by dawn as Beth and Cassie rush to the elevator. At this point, I might would just jump out of a goddamn window. Literally, you're looking at what, like six deadites in a hallway? Yeah, and it gets gets worse. I think I would just be like, you know, fuck this elevator. Let's, I'm just going to they're gonna hope I fucking land in a trash can or something. <laughs> a truck going by. I don't know. <laughs> well, one thing I love about this movie is that they, they killed the kids. That sounds, that sounds awful. But uh, the, when I first seen this, my thought in the movie theater was, it was, gonna was be all the that adults? They, they added these neighbors in here just to have some people to kill and turn into demonites because they weren't going to kill the core three and i absolutely loved when ellie turned first because i thought she was going to be the final girl with the kids you know the strong mom character and you just don't see her going first so that was a a pleasant surprise and then that they off the kids man i I didn't think they were going to go there and i loved it that was good we get a you know it's not for the whole movie but we actually end up getting a lot of deadites here in this movie yeah we get a ton of them yeah so um matter of fact man they kill like four kids because there's almost more kids than there is adults because you got the two neighbors and then you got the two ellie's two kids so you have four total i mean shit one of them's like fucking eight years old kid gets his arms ripped off yeah they uh this demon 
does not like kids. Clearly. I don't think it likes anything. <laughs> so as the elevator door closes, we see the uh, lights come on and blood begin to pour from the buttons and the floorboards. And while this is happening, we start to see Danny and Bridget just peeling away Ellie's flesh on the sides of her body as the book's pages just go wild. As the elevator fills with blood, Cassie looks through the window to notice that Ellie, Danny, and Bridget are gone. Soon after the elevator is completely full of dark red blood, it reaches its weight capacity and falls quickly to the bottom floor. We then get one of the coolest shots of the movie where we see the bottom floor lobby just explode with blood, launching Beth and Cassie into the parking garage. Yeah, this looked like a major ode to The Shining. Maybe it was. I think it was, 100%. Even the way they shot it and the angles they shot it. When when we were in the theaters and this fucking elevator started filling with blood, I was so fucking stoked. Because you know every, your, your penis started filling with blood. It did. <laughs> it was fucking rock hard. Like I I I had to call. I had to call the Viagra number. Hard I had to tell a, him I didn't take Viagra, but I I've had a hard on for four hours. I'm hard as a diamond <laughs> in an ice storm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like you know every evil dead. To, to be a good evil dead, you got to have tons of blood. And this was the first, like, you, um, when I say tons, I mean ridiculous, like raining blood or something. And this was where we start getting into that part of the movie here. And I seen this elevator filling up and I was like, God damn it. Yes, this is a good movie. It is. This is where I was like, this, this is a good, this is, I, it was good up until this point, but now I know the rest of this movie is going to be good. Bro, they had to have so much blood. They haven't had to have a food company fucking make huge truckloads of it. That's wild. Yeah, for them to do this and to not do it with CGI or to not do some blood and then fill in a ton of it with CGI, huge props to them. Yeah, I'm actually going to, at the end of the episode, I'm actually going to talk about how they did it. And it's it's a really fascinating that they decided to go this route with it. They dropped them in an elevator full of blood and... Yes. They even, they even, I know they built the elevator with a certain type of wood that wouldn't stain from the blood when it was filled up in case they needed to use it for whatever scenes they shot in it after. I got, so, yeah, I yeah. got a lot of cool info on, on this scene itself. Yeah, it's awesome though. And very, 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 uh, shining esque. So, um, yeah, they, they spill out with the blood. They spill out all over the fucking, um, the lobby here. And Beth comes to just freaking out and completely soaked in thick red blood. She rushes over to an unconscious Cassie where she attempts to wake her up. By the way, this is actually a callback to the poltergeist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, the director is saying that he had her try to wake Cassie up the same way they tried to wake Carol Ann up comes in back. poltergeist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Cassie does finally wake up and ask Beth if, <laughs> if they are dead, which is a really good point. You just rode an elevator full of blood down to the bottom floor, and I would assume, like, this is hell, isn't it? This has got to be hell. I would wonder, the, the elevator being full of blood, you probably would survive that. Because yeah, I, I think know. I would think the water would, you know, things don't move in water. Water, water kind of slows things down. Slam. Like, if you shoot a bullet in the water, it's, it, the friction of the water coming down obviously slows the bullet down really fast. I would imagine... If you were floating at the top of this elevator and it hit the bottom, you would move a lot slower in the water. Well, also elevators are, they don't, they're designed, they never would free fall. They have all these safety counterweights that would, if you did fall, which does happen, but it's a slow fall. It's nowhere near like if you just cut the cord. Well, the demonites obviously destroyed the counterweights. Yes, they're true. demonites. So Beth and Cassie then run through the parking garage and jump into Ellie's car in order to escape, but the car gets stuck in a hole from the earthquake. Beth then looks back towards the elevator doors and spots something truly horrific. We see that Deadeye Ellie has combined her body with the bodies of her two Deadeye children, Bridget and Danny. Holy fuck, this would fuck me up. Like, I would probably die from fright. This is like, this turned Resident Evil for a second. Like, this is like, I mean, this is like a government creation gone wrong or something. I mean, this is, 
they show the drawing in the book, so you know this is mm-hmm. coming. And damn, it looks a lot scarier than it did, even in the fucking awesome drawing. And I love that because each book has a different final form. And obviously, this book's final form is, you know, the body parts all put together. But it makes the priest who did the recording, it makes a lot more sense because he says he hacked them up and it still didn't work. They they kept coming. And it makes sense that he obviously hacked them up and their body parts combined and still came after him. Yeah, this is truly like, I mean, to see just, to see, a, you know, people that you're not super familiar with combine their body parts as one thing, but to see your family members to turn into this thing and chase you and try to do whatever, you know, it's untelling what the fuck they would do. Yeah, man, I would literally shit myself and have a heart attack at the same exact time. <laughs> uh, imagine for, for the daughter, too. Like, that's her mom oh, God, and, and her kid. brother and sister's yeah. body parts. Yeah, that's fucking awful. So Beth and Cassie play a successful game of hide-and-go-seek with the creature for a bit before making their move towards the gate to escape. Beth makes it under, but Cassie then gets dragged back into the parking garage. The creature then throws Cassie in the back of Mr. Fonda's tree service truck where she gets an up and close personal meeting with her former siblings. Good God, they look fucking terrible. This is like the final boss that you face before you face (laughs) Satan himself. Yeah. This is like the, 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 the final or the second to last boss, but it ends up being harder to beat than the actual like final boss. Yeah, the, I don't know how they did it. I would love to see how they did it didn't have enough time to really look into it a lot but i mean i don't know how they got all the act all three actors there together like that like that man but the makeup is great they did a really good job i'm sure that this took for fucking ever this to was, get this looking good and set up right just for this quick scene i'm sure that this was one that that cgi had to be used for yeah. the faces and stuff and this is where it's necessary you know, something like this. You can't combine three actors you, together. You can't cut them up, <laughs> uh, especially the kids. There's laws against that. We also see here that Danny has the OG solid white eyes that we've seen from the original Deadites in the first movie. So the creature then goes to cut off Cassie's head with a chainsaw before Beth interrupts with a shotgun blast from behind, announcing Ash Williams' famous line, Come get some. But the glory is short-lived because the creature just throws the chainsaw at Beth, causing her to trip and fall off the back of the truck, dropping the gun. Now, I don't think I've mentioned it before, but there is a wood chipper connected to the back of this tree truck. And this is like where Beth and the creature, they're fighting like right in front of it. So just so there's not any confusion. You got the truck, you got the wood chipper, and they're kind of like right on the back of the wood chipper. How do you say such a badass line and then fall on your ass backwards right after? Well, you get a chainsaw thrown at you, though. That would that would fuck me up. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, like, a chainsaw has to be to be running the chain. Somebody has to, like, if you just throw a chainsaw at somebody, it's not it's not like American Psycho where he drops it off of the, off of the yeah. fucking top and it's still running, like, cuts her in half. But, yeah, I mean, just just skip the badass line and fall on your ass. So this creature grabs Beth's leg and begins dragging her to the wood chipper. Once they get her in, like there's like, you know, the little tray where you would like slide wood into the wood chipper. But once they get her in there, we see the deadite Bridget's arm come down and pull the lever for it to turn on. Now Cassie, who is hiding, is now standing by watching this and decides to jump into action and turn it off. And just as Beth's boots are about to go into the grinding blades, it shuts off and she falls back down on the concrete. The creature then starts climbing down towards her again, but this time Beth jumps up and grabs the chainsaw, ordering Cassie to turn the chipper back on. She then rams the saw right into Ellie's chest, pushing the creature slowly into the chipper. We then get a shot of the exit tube of the chipper where we just see tons of blood and flesh spraying all over the garage. It's beautiful, a true work of art, and future directors of Evil Dead movies take note. Yeah, this was about as fucking hundred percent Evil Dead as you could get. He, it was kind of a kind of an ode to the 2013 
with the blood well, raining where down, yeah. the ra- raining blood like yeah it's, it's it's literally raining blood in this like parking garage it's awesome so after a few minutes of this we see that the only part of the creature that is left is ellie's head and torso she attempts to speak to beth but beth just jams the chance the chainsaw into the top of her head literally turning her brain into paste Finally, just Deadeye Ellie's head is left, and Beth just soccer kicks that shit into the chipper, and that is the end of that. Bro, this was by far the coolest fucking shit. Like, I had forgot how awesome the practical effects at the end of this, but the chainsaw is, like, holding the body down, and after she makes her little line, it's holding the head down, and the body is getting ripped into yeah, shredded. The, and it it rips the body in half, and then it rips the other half of the body off of the head, and you get to see the whole torso get ripped open twice, and then off the head, and it fucking it 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 was terrifier level gore. I give them that. It was fucking awesome. I forgot about how truly awesome this was. It's like when you pull like tender meat apart. You know, like a fork. Something that's been in a slow cooker. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so so <laughs> Beth, Beth and Cassie then hug before grabbing the chainsaw and leaving the building. Hopefully, they're going to search for a good therapist. This, the screen then fades to black, and we jump to the next morning, still at the apartment building. And who do we see? Our girl, Jessica, from the opening of the film. She is on the phone with the other girl from the beginning and she is explaining how the earthquake knocked her power out and she got barely any sleep the night before, but she is excited about their trip to the cabin. As she goes to get in her car, she notices the blood-soaked tree tripper behind her and gets out to investigate. And we then get the infamous POV shot of the demon flying through the garage and right into Jessica. And that is the end of Evil Dead Rise. What a fucking awesome, awesome ending. The, the whole, the whole uh, wood chipper scene and the body being ripped apart. And then I, I will say, even, the, even Ellie's talking head looked good. Unlike the, the one in the beginning of the movie, which was very clearly CGI. I don't, I'm not sure how they did her face, but it, on the, the head, still talking, but it looked awesome. Then they pan down to this picture of Ellie and her kids, like having fun riding this oh, on the keys. vacation. Yeah, which I thought was a really, really good added detail. That hurts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, it was. It was a really, really grim way to wrap up that story, which I, I love. Thought it was really, really good added detail. And then to wrap up the beginning of the movie and connect it all, I thought was was awesome. Yes. Yeah, so. The the scene in which the elevator fills with blood was accomplished by lowering the constructed elevator into a 1,500 gallon tank of fake blood using a forklift. The following shot, which is a homage to the 1980 film The Shining, in which blood pours out of the elevator into the building's lobby, took place on a full-size set made partially from plywood. Two large Dump tanks attached to a ramp allowed the amount of liquid to pour out from the elevator doors at the desired speed. The special effects team ran rehearsals of the sequence using stunt performers and water. The scene was shot in two takes, once for the wide shots and once for close-ups with the actors. Using, uh, they used a multi-camera setup for this. Cronin stated, The cleanup would take about eight hours, and so if we didn't get it the first time, we would have to clean up and shoot it again at the end of the day. But we got it in the first pass. Fucking kudos to them for pulling this off on the first try. It looks amazing. With the actors, like the actors spilling out onto the fucking lobby with the, with, you know, 1,500 gallons of fucking fake blood. I am so glad that... Because when you look at this, after you hear that, and you think how much time and how much work, and most directors would have just CGI'd that shit. Oh, yeah. And they didn't do it, man. They fucking went for the real deal. Great yeah, job. I actually seen a, a, a YouTube video of a guy who does, like, effects and stuff recreate The Shining 
and shows how he goes in and builds the room and does the blood and stuff. And it looked good, but he compared it to the original Shining, and it, you could still tell it looks better with the actual practical effects. But they could have 100% did CGI here and got away with it. And huge kudos to them for not. I, if I was an actor and I was at this set, I'd be like, I'm, I fucking made it. Like, this yeah. is fucking awesome. Yeah, great job to the, the, um, the little girl actor and the, and the girl who plays Beth. For being willing to fucking do that. That's kind of sketchy. Yeah, that little girl's parents. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I really love some horror movies, man, but I would be a little sketch about my dumping yeah. my child out like that. Yeah, the fact that they actually had to get in the elevator and they lowered it down, which is how you see blood coming out of the floor. I mean, that's them lowering down into this tank. And then the elevator actually fills up with blood. And then they dump it. I mean, it's, yeah. It's it's impressive. It's so impressive. Fucking awesome. One one of the coolest shots of the entire movie. So this is the only Evil Dead film not to feature the 1973 Oldsmobile Delta 88 that we've seen in all the other Evil Dead movies. But I will say that the chainsaw, because normally the chainsaw in Evil Dead is red, they actually painted the chainsaw the same color as the Delta 88. So that's kind of their little bit of, I don't know why they couldn't get the Delta 88 or they didn't really say. But they said that they kind of paid homage to it with the chainsaw being the, the same color as the car. They spent every dime they had on practical effects. Yeah, probably. So the sound of Ellie biting out a man's eyeball in the hallway is actually an audio recording of Bruce Campbell furiously biting into an apple. I actually thought about that when I heard that. So that sounds like somebody like biting the shit out of an apple. Sounds great. Yeah. So... The main three deadites of the film all have different eye colors. This is why I kind of pointed out their eye colors throughout the plot. Ellie has the glowing silver eyes, Bridget has the golden yellow, and Danny has the solid white. While Ellie's eye color, the silver, is unique to her deadite, Bridget's is a reference to the 2013 remake and those deadites, which all had yellow eyes in that one, and Danny is a reference to the original Deadites who all had these solid white eyes that we've seen. And this kind of goes into this next little bit, which we kind of talked about earlier, where one of the lines being played on the record states that three volumes of the book exist. The first volume being the original Sam Raimi Bruce Campbell version, the second volume being the 2013 remake version, and the third volume being Evil Dead Rise, thus making the whole entire series canon together. So that's awesome because a lot of people debate, you know, 2013 being a remake, but it's actually a continuation of the story. And this kind of sums it all up where you have the demon eyes and you have the three sets of the books of the dead, the kind of volume. And it kind of just kind of ties everything up with a, with a nice bow. I, I would trust this guy with any Evil Dead after this. Oh, sure. Uh, the stuff he added and connected from, from past movies and the Easter eggs and the odes that they put in there to the prior movies, a lot of them, I, I knew that some of them were in there, but a lot of them I didn't notice until really doing this deep dive, and it is by far one of my favorite parts of the movie. So, ratings and kill count. So, we get total kills of 12. We have Jessica in the beginning, who was possessed by that demon. Caleb, which I guess her boyfriend, was decapitated. You have Ellie, who was possessed by the demon, and good God, she was killed in so many different ways. Jake, who, uh, I guess one of the teenage kids, he choked on an eyeball. Scott, who had his arms ripped off. Gabriel, who had his eye bit out and his throat torn out. Mr. Fonda, who was disemboweled. Bridget, who was possessed by a demon and killed in fucking three different ways. Danny, who was originally killed by being stabbed twice with the knife. Then you have, like, Danny again as a deadite, who was killed by the wood chipper. Deadite Bridget, who was killed by the wood chipper. And deadite Ellie, who was killed by the wood chipper. And then you have a bonus 13, which is the girl who gets her hair ripped out, but we don't really know if she dies from that or not. Rob, imagine getting cast in an Evil Dead movie, and they're like, "Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna die by choking on a CGI eyeball, and we're not really gonna get to see it." Well, what I, a letdown. Well, that's just like the, like I said, that was 
I believe that happened in the second one. Yeah. It was just a little homage to Evil Dead 2. All right, so favorite kill. You pick. I'm surprised you picked this. No, I thought I would always pick this movie. But you beat me to it. What's your favorite kill? I think I think we had this movie rated the same, so I think it was a 4.5. My best kill, I'm going to say the, the, uh, the wood chipper kill. Ellie specifically getting ripped in half at the end with her head held down by the chainsaw. By far, the Ellie demonite kill. By far the best. Not, nothing else even comes close. I would say the second would probably be the kid that got his eye bitten out and then his throat slashed through the peephole because the practical effects on the throat slash, like it wasn't like a simple throat slash. It was it was pretty deep. And the shot through the, the peephole was just awesome. Yeah, my favorite kill is, is, of course, like, you know, the wood chipper, hand, that's a hands down. I did do my close second, though, is actually Bridget deep throating Staphne. I, mm. I love that scene. It grosses me out, like, the the part where just like almost even the look on her face when it's just hanging out of her mouth and she's almost like the deadite doesn't even know what to do at first. And then it just pulls it out and you think you think it's going to pull it out and then like go back to trying to kill somebody. But it really surprised me about it just kind of falling dead. But it's honestly the scene where she's pulling it out and the sound of it and it's really slow. And it's but I will say this is a fucking hard movie to pick any kind of favorite kill. Yeah, I did. There's so much good shit in here. I didn't pick, I didn't consider Stephanie a kill because she's, she's not dead yet. She does, I don't, I don't know if she's doing her demonite fake dead thing. I didn't consider that a full kill because she was already a demonite and then she's still alive when she comes out into the hall. But yeah, that, that scene's fucking awesome. All right. So rating, rating. I gave this movie a 4.8. I think this 100% Evil Dead, uh, huge props to them for pulling it off. In the complete opposite setting of a normal Evil Dead movie, the Deadites were not only scary looking, but they're, they're which is something I don't point out very often, but the dialogue for, for the Deadites specifically was fucking super unsettling at times, super savage. Practical effects were amazing. The blood was never ending, uh, especially in the elevator scene and the wood chipper ending. You got to have that in Evil Dead, obviously. I really, really loved the, the added backstory explaining the, the different Necronomicons and there being three and connecting this to the original movies and the 2013 edition. I thought the actors were great. Dialogue, relationships, all that felt super authentic. I think I gave it a 4.5. Last time, and I did. I, I gave it a four point five yeah, last time. Mine was either a four point five or a four point six on her best of episode, from my memory. And I, I, during the movie deep diving in it, I I did jump around. You know, at one point I was under that, and then I ended up over it. And obviously, I finished over it. the The only negative things that I picked up were some of the CGI parts. But the practical effects that they use towards the end and the amount kind of make up for that. And then on the positive side, like I mentioned earlier, there was just tons of, of references, Easter eggs and odes to the original Evil Dead that I didn't pick up on because I hadn't just watched the original. And that, that just made it so much better. Uh, overall, gory, dark, unsettling version. The Evil Dead that we love. It's absolutely a must watch. Yeah, I started out with the 4.5 because of my original rating. But after watching original Evil Dead and then immediately watching this after and then knowing kind of all the little background stuff that we knew about both movies and really seeing what the team that put together this movie, the director, you know, the guys from Ash vs. Evil Dead, it upped my rating and I ended up rating it a 4.9. The only thing that I knocked it on was, and it's so stupid, was the cabin. I really would have rather seen the normal cabin in the beginning. And then they couldn't get the Delta 88. Like, if they just would have had a scene where the Delta 88, like, is parked in the garage or pulls up at the end of the movie, I probably would have gave it a five-star movie. That goddamn cabin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, like I said, it's, it's, it's really dumb. 
But that's really the only negative thing I have to say about it. I love these are my favorite group of characters because I felt for the family that died. I really liked all the characters, which is not the case for all the Evil Deads. I mean, we talked about like Scotty last time. I couldn't, you know, no one really likes Scotty. Then you got like the remake where you got that fucking the guy with the glasses who kind of causes who, everything. He, yeah, the guy who literally cuts Bob Wire off, and then that. He's the only one who doesn't have a recording bringing this back. Yeah. And it's not even written in the book. It's literally saying it's hidden in the book and don't say it, don't think it, don't read it. And he literally takes a piece of paper and figures out like that it's actually in the pages itself and traces over them so he can fucking read it out loud. Yeah. Like, what an idiot. But yeah, anyway, it's a fantastic movie. I will say if, if you listened to this and you haven't seen this movie, Watch it because there was only so much I could describe. There is so much more in this movie that I just don't have time to 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 tell you about. Oh, uh, especially like the kills and the creepy stuff. I mean, you know, we only cover like sixty percent, seventy percent of really what you see. So go watch it for sure. Yeah, I I would I would add to that. I would say watch the original and then watch this right after because yeah, it makes yeah. it it makes it so much better to pick up on. A lot of the references. You know, I mean, it, it could land on my number one spot for best of 2024. <laughs> like, I, man, I don't know. It's getting number one spot two years in a row. I don't know how that, I don't know how that works, but I haven't seen a movie yet this year that I liked as much as this movie. How could it, it didn't come out this year. I don't care. You, okay. <laughs> well, you said you didn't know how that worked. I didn't. thought that was pretty clear rules to I, to the end of the year episode. I'm just saying, like, hey, we got Terrifier three coming this year, though. Oh I think man, that's it's gonna, gonna be tough. Be, I think that's gonna be a good one. It's gonna be tough. Uh, but once again, we thank you guys for listening. Please give us a follow or like if you enjoy the show. Check out the website. Check out our socials. Tell a friend, a family member, or your titty sucking parasites about the show. We hope to see you next time. Any last words? Don't choke on that demon semen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>